Good afternoon, everyone. Um, switching from German to English, I'm sorry, I don't speak really a word of German. Um, en français, je peux. En espagnol, puedo. I'm trying. I'm going to make my way around the world through languages. Um, so, this is a bit of a switch. You, you are all from the IT world. I'm from sort of out there in the jungle in the middle of the oceans. And uh, many of you may know my family. Uh, my grandfather was Jacques Cousteau. I know there's at least one diver out there. I had a conversation with someone who's done 800 dives. Um, is anybody else a diver? Okay, we have at least a couple in the front row, a couple back there, good. Um, does everybody know Jacques Cousteau? <laughs> Sometimes I speak at universities and, and kids who are 18 have absolutely no idea who he is. So I always check in just to see. Um, I know that um, you've, you've had a lot of learning uh, in this past couple of two days. And I'm here to take you on a voyage. So it's a little bit different than what you've been seeing. My um, family was a bit different from a lot of families. And my grandfather, as you all know, was on expedition and discovering the underwater world and bringing it back to all of you through his imageries, through his photography, through his videos. But what is lesser known is that my grandmother was on Calypso and she was there more than anybody else in the family. She would actually board Calypso at the port and she would not come home until Calypso came home. She is in the middle of there, if you can see her. This is uh, basically a, a bigger version of the crew of Calypso. And in the background, you see Alcyon, which was the second ship of my grandfather uh, with the wind turbines. It actually is still in existence and still working. Amongst all those men is also my mother, who was an expedition photographer for 13 years. And you didn't see her on camera because she was behind the camera. And both my grandmother and my mother did this at a time where women didn't go on expedition. It was uh, lesser known, perhaps some scientists had been out in the field. But as far as joining a production team and being part of the team, this was really unique. Uh, my father is there as well, Jean-Michel, and he's been working and had been working with my grandfather since the 1970s. When my uncle Philippe passed away in 1979, my grandfather asked my father to join him full time. Um, at that point, my father had been an architect in California, which is why I have no French accent. <laughs> and, um, and he decided to leave his architecture work and, and continue with my grandfather full time. It is a life that's very hard to resist. Um, and it's, it's a pledge really to, to look at what this family has done and now to look at my generation. Both my brother and I are working in the field of the environment. I have two cousins doing the same in the United States. And I have an uncle from my grandfather's second marriage who is also doing similar things here in Europe. So it, it really is a testament to what one person can do. And no matter where I travel around the world, whether it's South America, whether it's Europe, whether it's North America, I have yet to explore parts of Asia, people tell me that they grew up with my grandfather. And that for me is truly inspiring to think that one person can have an impact on so many people around the world. Now, he was around at a time where he was a pioneer because nobody was exploring the underwater world because filmmaking and documentary filmmaking was new. So he wasn't competing with 300 in the United States channels, perhaps 30 channels in other countries. He was really the only one doing it. But what it did is it opened up a generation's eyes to what was going on under the water and brought them to travel with him. Now, this is a smaller production crew. Here you can see my mother. She's the petite French woman carrying the heaviest bag. <laughs> she refused to let anybody carry any of her things. And I have to admit, when my mother calls me stubborn, I look back at her and I say, where did I inherit it from? I do the same when I'm with my crew. Now, much as is represented here, you have about 70, 80% men um, in your organizations here. It's about the same when we are out in the field. So I am one of few women um, that are out there doing this. And what I'm trying to do is really inspire a younger generation, inspire college age and even high school age children and girls to understand and really feel that they can live this kind of life as well. Now, I am not naive in thinking that this is given to everybody. I was born into a family that enabled me to do the work that I do. What I have done with that is take that to other places and try to inspire other people, but also try to in get them to think about 
what that they can do with their lives and how they can take what they are already doing and be a part of the environment. So whether you're in the IT world, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're an architect, we are all connected to the environment. It's one thing that we all have in common no matter what we do and where we live. So that is something that I encourage people to do regardless of their profession. This is what a uh, film crew looks like now. The cameras are a bit different. Um, again, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the differences as well between my generation and my mother and my grandmother is that I'm actually in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. So again, a way to get a message out to girls and women out in the world to be able to think that they can be also a part of this kind of community. One of the places that has impacted me the most um, is the Amazon. In the early 80s, my grandfather was on expedition in the Amazon for 18 months. And it was at a time where the Amazon was very little explored. Uh, the different uh, indigenous tribes there were not very well known. Some were uncontacted still at that time. And I went down, I flew down with my grandfather to join Calypso. And of course, my grandmother was on the boat already. My grandmother had sailed all the way from Virginia in the United States all the way down to the mouth of the Amazon, gone up the Amazon River. My grandfather would fly in and out because he had to be in cities for business. At nine years old, the images and the stories that I saw there and the people that I met had a profound impact on me that I would not understand until I was an adult. 25 years later, my father, my brother, and I went back to the Amazon to create a two-hour documentary called Return to the Amazon. And exactly as it indicates, Return to the Amazon was going back to places that my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother, my father, and my brother and I had been 25 years earlier. And look at what had happened in 25 years, both in terms of the environment, in terms of the people as well. And some places we weren't able to go to, some places we were, and things have changed drastically. Now one thing that's important to understand when you look at the Amazon, if you fly above the Amazon, it looks like a green sea. All you see is trees, you see rivers winding through. But you need to also think that there is a micro community that lives within the macro world. You have tiny insects that live there. You have toads, butterflies. Uh, this is actually just the skin of an insect. I went out with a biologist one night and we did night shooting. You can get a lot more frogs at night. And this is an insect that had shed its skin. Um, so it's really, it's, it's the whole, all of it's connected. It's something that my, my grandfather has said, it's something that my father continues on with his work. Everything is connected. Whether you're here in Switzerland or in the Amazon, all of these things come together as one. So when you look at the bigger picture, always remember that there are these little units, much like a company has different employees at different levels working. They're all cogs in the wheel. Um, I, I was listening to somebody earlier say that there was a gentleman who talked about biomimicry earlier, um, a car that had been inspired by a fish. And it really brings to mind the fact that nature has already invented everything. We can be inspired by that and interpret it to our human needs and our human species in whatever way we want. Nature is mathematics. There's a great, I'm gonna now give away my generation, I see a lot of things on YouTube and Vimeo. <laughs> But there's a great uh, video on YouTube that talks about uh, looking at nature in the terms of mathematics. And so to bring that to people who perhaps don't have a connection with the environment is another way of speaking a different language. Now when we were in the Amazon, we went to Iquitos. And Iquitos is uh, in Peru. It's one of the more isolated cities of the Amazon. You can only get there by plane or by boat. And we went to an area called Belen, which is in this photograph here. And Belen is the slum area of Iquitos. Now, as you can see, the people that are living there are living in homes on stilts. Some of them live actually in floating homes. So their homes are on these big logs that actually float. So when the river, when the Amazon River comes up, their homes float up. And when the Amazon River goes down, so do their homes. Now, the people that live in the homes on stilts, they just watch the water rise and fall below their homes. But this area doesn't have any kind of drainage. There is no disposal for human or other waste. So everything goes out the windows, it goes into the Amazon River. When the water rises, it takes all of that away, including all of the trash, and it flows downriver. So if you don't think you're connected to the Amazon, all of that ends up in the Pacific. And same thing, anything that we do here in Switzerland, you have water draining from, from the Swiss mountains down, eventually ends up in the oceans, 
comes back around. You eat fish, any kind of contamination that is in the water system, in the oceans or in the rivers, comes back to you on that plate. Again, everything is connected. What I was really touched by when I went, um, wow, now in 2005 and 6, <laughs> to the Amazon to do this uh, documentary, were the people. Now, my background is not science. I didn't study biology. I'm not an oceanographer. I studied people. My undergraduate degree was psychology. My graduate degree was intercultural relations. And the idea with, with intercultural relations was how do I talk to people across industries how do I talk to people across cultures to get them to care and understand that they are connected to the environment? When I went to the Amazon and we were invited to a, an indigenous conference, in the Valle do Javari in the Brazilian Amazon is about 9,565,000 hectares or so of an indigenous uh, reserve. Now, there are six contacted and six uncontacted tribes there. This conference brought together the six contacted tribes. And we, as a production team, were invited to go and be a part of the conference as the only outsiders or non-Brazilians that were allowed to come in. And the days that we were there, we were talking about environment. And the two days we were filming, they were talking about health. Now, environment and health are inextricably connected. What we learned there is that 80, 80% of the indigenous population in this reserve have some form of hepatitis. Hepatitis. It seems something that in our cultures is completely obsolete. You go into your doctor, you get a series of shots, it's done. But in these cultures, it isn't. What I walked away with from that conference is a sense of a need to do something, is a sense of a need not just to hear what the problems were, but to move to action. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a surgeon, but I am a caring person, and I am somebody who has resources and networks to people who can bring that kind of medical attention down. So I spent a year on my evenings and weekends when I wasn't doing my job, <laughs> trying to bring a medical team down there at least once a year through a university that would sponsor their students to go down and spend a month or two to work with these different tribes who needed more medical attention. Because what was happening is the Brazilian government was actually cutting their health workers down to that region from nine people to four. Four people for over nine million hectares to take care of these people is insufficient. After a year, I kept being met with wall after wall after wall of no. The government didn't want foreigners coming in and doing something that they should do. The governmental health organization that was supposed to bring medical attention to these people said, we don't need your help, we can do it. If you want to support, support us. And after a year of this not being my full-time job, I realized that I couldn't do it. And it was one of the more difficult moments of my life to walk away and not help, to say, I can't do it because I felt that I was letting down the 3,179 people that lived in that area. Two weeks later, I received an email from a nonprofit organization called Amazon Promise. Had never heard of them before. They bring medical teams down to the Peruvian Amazon into remote indigenous and mestizo populations of Peru. Now, why did that come to me? Some word of mouth through somebody else, but just when I said I couldn't do this, another way came through for me to be able to help. And right away, I signed up to be a volunteer with this medical team. I figured I can clean wounds, I can wash lice, I can give medication, I can help the doctors, I speak Spanish, so I was able to translate. And I went with this medical team for two weeks. From there was born my nonprofit. I went and I asked the founder of the organization if she would mind if I filmed everything that they did. And she didn't. So if I wasn't with a patient, I was filming. If I wasn't washing lice, I was taking photographs. And at the end, I created a 10 minute, seven minute short documentary about the nonprofit organization. And there I realized this is what I can do. I can take my background, my formal education background, I can take what my family has done for generations and what my interests are in that connection between humans and the environment and do something with it. So what I've done is created cost-centric productions. We do short videos 
short video documentaries about nonprofits and individuals who don't have the means to create their own communications through a video that can help them fundraise, truthfully. I'm going to show you just a small bit of that first project. Um, it's on my website, so you can go and see the, the entire piece there, um, just so you have an idea a little bit of, of what it looks like and what this organization does. The Amazon really has a hold on me. And the communities out here, the indigenous people, are really the caretakers of the Amazon. So hopefully, by taking care of these people, taking care of their health, we're also, in the long run, taking care of this environment. The Amazon is very difficult to live in. Every day for the people that live in these isolated communities is a struggle just to get food. And they depend on the NGOs, such as Amazon Promise, to come in and give them medical attention. Health is such an important, huge issue. I mean, it's the most important, you know. Health is the most important. You can, education is up there, but if you're not healthy, you can't study, you can't educate yourself or be educated if you're not healthy. I was a jungle guide on the rivers and the villages, bringing adventure tourists through. More and more, I started seeing how people were very sick, and then I wasn't able to help them very much. People would kind of sit around my mosquito and wait for me to wake up so they could ask me for medicines. And uh, at one point, I had to give stitches. It was kind of like, you know, this is kind of getting scary. People were counting on me for their medical care. And I just realized that I was going to have to do something more than just bring tourists through the trade for their artisania and their crafts. So little by little, I was able to get people together involved that were interested. You know, we were able to help people very easily with very little at the beginning. That's how it started. So it became a formal uh, nonprofit in the States in 1993. So that's um, it's just a preview. Um, the rest of the story goes on to explain what we did and how we got there and how we helped people and the fact that there is still so much more to do. And when I have moments where I feel completely overwhelmed, where my plate is full because I have 10 projects, I have to do logistics and pre-production, I'm on the road, I'm coming to conferences, I'm going to universities, I have the desire to help other people, I'm ambassador to different projects, I stop, I take a deep breath, <laughs> and I think about Patty. Because I asked her, I said, how do you do this? It seems never-ending. You, you have the Peruvian Amazon jungle people to heal and to help. How do you keep doing? And she says, you know, whether I help one person, 30 people, or 100 people, at least I'm doing something. And I keep remembering that. When I feel overwhelmed, when I think there's too much on my plate, when I feel that there are too many projects and too many people to help, and environments to save, and projects to work on, conservation organizations to support, you stop and you take a deep breath and you realize, at least you're doing something. And that one movement to action really does make a difference. One person recycling a glass bottle isn't going to save the world, but everybody thinking that same way, not just about recycling, but about the whole process, is going to change the world. And it's not overwhelming when you think that way. Now, when we were down there, we always work with local people. And uh, this is Ramon. Ramon was, uh, is still, I hope, <laughs> a shaman. And um, he was a Quechua Ashuar, uh, two different tribes, and so he was our spokesperson when we went to these different villages. We never went into a village unless the uh, village had, had requested this organization to go in. And uh, I show you this picture because I think I'm married, um, but I'm not sure. So, <laughs> and I, I'd have to go back down to find out. Ramon was looking for a wife. Um, and he painted all of the volunteers, and I asked him what it meant, because everything means something. You don't just do something for nothing. And he just laughed. And I said, no, really, Ramon, what does this mean? He goes, ah, and he hugs and kisses me. The next time I saw Ramon, he, had, he asked me for cologne. So <laughs> I don't know what a shaman in the Amazon jungle needs cologne for, maybe rituals. But when I gave him the cologne, the necklace he's wearing around his neck, he put around my neck and then kissed me again. So um, I think I'm married. And it could be worse, I guess. <laughs> um, so now I've taken you a little bit topside. I'm going to take you a little bit underwater. 
Um, one of the really important things for me in, in explaining a little bit about the, our connections to the natural world is animals. And people ask me, are you ever scared underwater? I haven't been scared by any animals underwater. I've been cautious. Um, I have been careful. I have learned about them before getting in the water. Scared? No. I've been scared by an ocean current that almost swept me away. Um, but animals? Animals are different. Um, they don't have malicious intent. They don't look at you thinking that, hmm, how can I harm this person? Uh, we do hear of shark attacks, and a lot of times, well, if you think about it, we have our noses and our hands to feel. Um, we can take a little bite of food and say, do I like this, do I not? A shark just has teeth and the sensory on the front. So in order to decide whether or not they want to actually eat something, they have to take a nibble. Um, uh, I find it kind of funny, but... <laughs> Um, this was a tiger shark off the coast of Australia. She was about uh, three and a half meters long. And um, we worked with a team of scientists looking at different shark species. We were catching and tagging sharks. No harm was done to this animal. Um, what we did is we would bring her, it's a long process that I won't explain everything to, but we would bring her to the back of the boat, take a tissue sample, attach a satellite tag to her dorsal fin so that we could track where she was going. It's not enough to know to protect a species, you have to know where the species lives so you can protect the area that they're in. All of these encounters with different animals, this is an easier one for people to understand, dolphins. Uh, this is off the coast of Hawaii, they're not trained. <laughs> Um, all of these different action, interactions with animals are, are really important to understand our place in the natural world. We are, after all, just another species. One of, um, one of the more amazing opportunities I had was um, this one. And I'm back in the Amazon now. We had an opportunity to actually come across a, she was probably about five meters long, anaconda. And uh, the reason we found her once again was working with local people. The people of the village that we were near, a lot of them were actually hunters, and that's the way they live. They live off the land, cultivating and off hunting animals. And um, they knew of the existence of this anaconda, so when we arrived, they brought us to her so that we could film her. And I keep calling it a her, I don't know, it might have been a him. And we had an opportunity to go for a swim. She obviously wasn't hungry, I'm still here. I was probably the easier target, I'm a little more petite to swallow. Anacondas are known to eat caimans, um, and uh, I don't know if it's myth or fact, but there are stories of humans in the Amazon being eaten by anaconda. Um, there's one story of a man who got so drunk, he stumbled into the forest and uh, never returned. And a couple of days later, the village came across an anaconda that had the shape of a human inside. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> Again, we, we, uh, we stood on land watching her for a couple of hours before um, we did anything. And um, that's, you know, the documentaries that you see are, are what happens after hours of filming. Because we shot 180 hours of documentary in the Amazon and we came out with a two hour film. So all of that footage, a lot of it is just, just standing there and looking at these animals. Um, two weeks ago, I returned from Chile. I've been there for the past four months uh, filming a documentary television series for Chilean television called Oceano, which is oceans, Chile in front of the ocean. And um, we did uh, basically the entire coastline from the northern end of Chile in uh, San Pedro de Atacama, which is the Atacama Desert, all the way down to Antarctica. And, um, my videographer and I pulled together some footage so I could bring this to you as we just got back. Um, so we're just going to show you some excerpts, a little bit here and there of what we saw. This is Patagonia, very well known around the world because it is absolutely stunning. Um, we went to this area because we were diving in some of the lakes. We wanted to see what, what the lakes were like underwater, not topside. And we were looking at the, um, the different kinds of flora and fauna that are in that area. And what we did on this day was go with this man, Claudio Almarza, who is a specialist in photographing pumas. And we were able to get close to a mother and two of her small kittens um, eating. The kittens, mind you, are about this big. <laughs> so that's a kitten right there. <laughs> Now, approaching these animals, again, we're working with a specialist, and, and approaching them was quite interesting. We, um, 
he knew where the carcass was of the guanaco. The guanaco is a little bit like a llama. And so the next day, um, he took us there right before sunset because uh, felines are nocturnal, so they feel safest at night, and that's when they hunt. And he figured if the carcass is still there, the animals will come back. So we arrived around 8 p.m. It's summer down there, so it was still light. And uh, we were able to see the mother and both of her cubs um, who were eating there. You can see that's me crawling. Um, that's my puma crawl. <laughs> And we sat there for about two hours um, filming the puma. And with approaching them as, as quietly as we did, you saw the first image, they ran away. That's because we were standing and we started taking a couple steps towards them and psh, they went. When we crawled towards them, they would look up every now and then and then go back down to eat and look up every now and then go back down to eat. Now it's nighttime, obviously, and I'm shining my flashlight and holding my camera right at her we were maybe eight meters away. Um, the mother ha didn't come back. And one of the cubs partway through left. And we're sitting there in pitch black with a flashlight on the second cub. And all of a sudden it dawned on us, wait a second, where's the mother and the other cub? Are we the next meal? <laughs> we decided it was time to go. <laughs> An absolutely beautiful area. If you ever have a chance to, to travel to Chile, um, it is one of those iconic places, but it is, there is a very good reason why, and that's because it is absolutely stunning. Um, going further south, we went to Antarctica. And I have to admit, I never wanted to go to Antarctica. I am maybe one of the few people that says that, because so many people have dreams of this white continent. I don't like the cold. I like where it's warm. When, I, when summer is there, I'm happy. When winter comes, I start finding airplane tickets to go south and projects in South America. I was absolutely stunned and amazed by Antarctica. And I now really understand what it's about. We asked people a very simple question. What is Antarctica? And you would think Antarctica is the end of the world. Antarctica is the lost continent. Everybody responded, Antarctica is the beginning of everything. Antarctica is where it starts. Climate change can be seen and felt and measured in Antarctica like you wouldn't find it in other places. The animals there all depend on krill. Krill is a small, tiny little shrimp that is completely impacted by the warming of the oceans. You have these little creatures that depend on krill. You have uh, leopard seals that eat these little guys and eat krill. You have whales that come to that area to eat krill. So it's an entire ecosystem that has for a base this tiny little crustacean that if it goes away, the entire food chain dies. Now, in order to um, get close to these penguins, we didn't really have to try very hard. It's a little bit like the Galapagos. They're not used to humans being any kind of threat. So you basically go on land. They do walk around you. Um, our crew dropped myself and my videographer off on this little strip of land, and they said, we'll be right back, and they left. And three hours later, <laughs> they came back to get us. So needless to say, we were slightly wet. Filmmaking these days is quite different. You remember the second picture I showed you with my mother standing in the middle and the film crew with the big cameras? We now go in, and all of you who are in technology must know, but we can now go in with tiny little HD cameras what I had on a monopod there, just the stick, is a small HD camera, which I could push out very far right in front of the penguins, and they would walk in front of it unabashedly without any worry. So we can really get some pretty amazing footage with not much. And again, what I do with my nonprofit, with Cosscentric, is if I can't carry it on my back, I don't want it with me. Because I figure that's the stealthiest and easiest way for me to get into far-flung places like this. If anybody has thought about going to Antarctica, hopefully this is an inspiration to go. Um, it's the cliché images that you see on any kind of Antarctica expedition, and it is, it is stunning. We were actually able to go because we were sponsored by a, um, a travel company that had a boat that was taking a group of tourists. So we were slightly limited in where we could travel. Uh, the budgets these days are a little bit different. My grandfather could ask for money and anybody would give it to him. It's a little bit different now. Maybe if you could smile down from heaven. Um, we also trained to dive. 
And uh, this picture was actually not taken in Antarctica. It was taken in the southern canales of, of uh, Chile. So right around Patagonia, but on the water side. And what we did is we were training to use new equipment. Um, these are dry suits. Underneath the dry suits, for those of you who are divers, are these very thick three, um, they're not three millimeter, but 300 grade, I think they're called, one piece suits that basically you walk around like the Michelin man, like this. You can't do anything by yourself. You have to put your ego away. <laughs> you have to give up all dignity um, because they have to dress you and undress you, essentially. Um, you put on a pair of gloves. Over that goes these almost kitchen, um, rubber kitchen gloves, and they snap on. You have no feeling in your fingers. In order to release water, uh, air from a dry suit, you have to turn this knob here. You can barely reach it. You have to take one arm, grab the other one, and sort of do this. Um, and then you get in zero degree water. Yay. <laughs> it was actually amazing. This was not very fun. We got in the water. I held my hand here, and I couldn't see it. So we got out of the water. <laughs> but this was our training for um, a much more amazing dive, um, which was diving in Antarctica. We were, this is uh, Ushuaia. We left from Ushuaia. We crossed uh, the Drake Passage. Um, all of you familiar with the Drake Passage? Yes, more or less. Um, the Drake Passage has a notorious reputation for tossing boats all over the place and for being the absolute worst passage. We had amazing waters. And on the way back, I made the mistake of saying to the captain, God, it looks like a lake. And he gave me the most dirty look. He said, don't you ever talk like that about the Drake Passage. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. All respect to the Drake Passage. So we got down there, and this was uh, one of our first dives along a wall. Um, you're going to see some sea life. People ask me, is there anything that lives there? Well, yes, there is. Um, again, like I said, a lot of things that are there are these little tiny krill, tiny shrimp. Um, but then you also have sea life along the walls. Anything that, that life can cling on to, they will. And that's the amazing thing about the ocean is you, you put a shipwreck in the ocean, and all of a sudden you have an entire ecosystem that um, grows around it. Penguins. They're quite shy underwater. Um, in testing the equipment out, we also went to uh, Port Lockroy, which is, again, if you're going to go on a tourist boat, you're going to come across Port Lockroy. There's a post office, so you can actually stamp and send something home. Port Lockroy was a um, whaling station, and all of these are whale bones. And they're just completely shattering, as you can see, when they're touched. Um, a lot of whales were were exterminated in, in Antarctica. And it, it's quite a sad story. But what was amazing for us is we got to dive on a whaling ship that sunk. <laughs> so for us, that was actually a happy story. Um, once again, nobody died in the, <laughs> in the whaling ship. Once again, you see all this life cling to it. You have these, these bright yellow sponges, and they almost look like coral growing off of the ship. And the problems we were having is that when you're in water that cold, uh, this water here was about negative two Celsius. When you're in water that cold, your equipment can fail, which is exactly what's happening to me here. What I'm, what I'm saying to him in sign language is that I have a free flow coming out my regulator. Essentially what happens is this part, your first stage, which takes the air from your tank, I'm gonna make it simple, takes the air from your tank and lets you breathe, freezes. So the valve opens and just lets air out. There's no stopping of the air. Um, so essentially what you get is just a free flow of air, at which point it's not dangerous unless you're almost out of air and very deep. But essentially what happens is you just have air coming out and it's, you know, time to leave the dive and go up. We were able to dive around icebergs. Um, clear blue water, absolutely incredible. You have this very surreal blue color. Um, you can almost, I mean, I don't know if you can almost imagine the sounds that you hear. They're very surreal, sort of the cracking of ice. The striation you see here is when this iceberg was actually a part of the glacier and moves, almost like it's alive. It creates these little lines that, that are a sign of life, almost. Um, this is a Weddell seal. She was mildly curious about us and then went back to sleep. So diving experience in Antarctica, something that I would not hesitate one second to do again. So I'm glad that I went to a place that I never aspired to go and, and that I came back um, with a desire to go back again. Um, one of the places we went to was this island. This is Robinson Crusoe Island. 
in the Juan Fernandez archipelago. If you take Chile and you kind of cut it in half and then go out to sea, that's where you are. Um, do you all remember in February of last year the earthquake and tsunami that hit Chile? The anniversary of that was February 27th of this year. And we went to this island um, not because it was impacted by the earthquake, didn't get touched by the earthquake, but because it really was impacted by the tsunami that hit it. And Chile is a country that is used to earthquakes. They're, they're on a fault line. They're used to tremors on a regular basis. But this was an extremely um, intense earthquake that really shattered a lot of lives. And the tsunami that came after it is really what caused a lot of devastation. So we did a whole chapter on the post-tsunami and the tsunami and how do people recover from that. This village um, lost 16 people, which you might think is not a lot, but for a village that has barely a thousand, it really is. And the, if you see the grass that's down below, all the way to the first homes, that's what was taken away by the waves. There was a school, uh, the post office, businesses were there. You had um, small bed and breakfast, small hotels, and some homes. Luckily, a lot of people did get out, but the tsunami, the waves hit at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, I guess it's lucky that it was on a Saturday. A lot of people were up partying, <laughs> so they were actually awake and were able to make it to safety. And what we did is we talked to some absolutely incredible and inspiring people who made it through the night. There's one woman in particular, Ilka, who um, lives right by and right in front of the ocean. She built her home there. She built a small cottage and bed and breakfast there for guests. And when we, when we got there a year later, she had rebuilt her home in the exact same place. Now, the government was giving subsidies to the people that had lost their homes to be able to build their homes up in the hills. But Ilka said, this is, this is where I live. Why would I want to go live in the hill? So the government said, well, we can't help you. You're on your own. She is 65 and was swept out in her home. She had about this much air left in her home. All, everything was closed. And so she went up for one last breath, took a deep breath, dove into her house and found a way out and then found herself out to sea and made it through the night. And when I asked her, like I ask a lot of people, are you angry with the ocean? Are, are you afraid of it now? She said, no, I love it more. I said, why? She goes, because the ocean left me my life. And in that moment, a lot of things came clear, which they do. I, we, we all have that capacity of just these intense moments of clarity when everything comes into focus. She realized that the most important thing she had was not her belongings, it was her. And yes, the ocean took a lot of things, but it left her her life. And every day she goes out and sits on the beach with her accordion and sings a song to the ocean. This woman is truly a hero for me and, and really inspiring. One of the projects that is happening, this is the village from, from up top, one of the projects that is happening through a nonprofit organization down there is they're cleaning up the bay. Because as you can imagine, everything that was on land has to be somewhere. So those tractors, those houses, the chairs, the tables, the dishes, the clothes, the dishwasher, everything is somewhere. And all of it, most of it, is in the ocean. So this project, this is actually a ship that we were on um, that got pulled out and sunk in only about 10 meters of water. Um, there's a cleanup of the bay. And they had three months worth of funding to go out every day with a group of, of divers. They trained local people to become divers to clean up. They cleaned one third of the bay from zero to 20 meters. Now what we're pulling up here is pieces of rooftops. We're pulling up tablecloths. We're pulling up, you'll see a chair. I mean, absolutely everything. And it's incredible. You think that you're going to go under and you're just going to see piles of things, but you don't. It's already buried by the sand. So you have to go along the bottom and look for shapes that don't match a square. And you pull it up and you realize it's a piece of roof. There goes the chair. It's a little eerie. You know, we were able to go with them on the last dive the absolute last dive of funding. But only one third of the bay from zero to 20 was cleaned. It's not hard math. What about from 20 meters on? Hasn't been touched. And I look at this, and then I, and this is, this is only uh, maybe a month's worth of trash that they pulled out. Uh, big ships were, were actually removing the rest of the, uh, from before. And I look at this, and, and this is nothing compared to what just happened in Japan. 
It is nothing. The amount of devastation that's happened there is hundredfold. The amount of lives lost, so much bigger. And you think that, for me, I look at how the people are reacting to it and how they're bouncing back and how they remain respectful and hopeful. But it's because they have an infrastructure and an economy that can help them recuperate. You look at Haiti and you look at Chile, that infrastructure and the economy isn't there. Chile more so, but Haiti, no. All of these people live and depend on the ocean and on nature, and they can, will continue to do so. We all will continue to do so. While we were there, um, we had another absolutely amazing opportunity, and you can't plan this. We were going from one dive to another, and um, we got a radio call from fishermen. They um, let us know that there was a humpback whale, they just said a whale, but it ends up being a humpback whale, that was caught in a net. You can see the net there on the left. And it just happened to be that not even one kilometer away was a boat full of divers with their wetsuits on. That was us. And because we were filming, we had all of our cameras. Now, none of us had experience in untangling a whale. If you look at her tail, it's cut halfway through. And on the other side, it's cut slightly. And that's because the weight was about 250 kilos of netting. On that net, you have the floaters that enable the net to stay afloat. And then you have the sinkers, these pieces of lead that sink the bottom part of the net down so that it can catch fish. And these are ghost nets. They're just floating out to sea, untethered. This is after we were able to cut one side. Um, you can see she's still pulling at it. Now, her family had already migrated and left her because she couldn't keep up. Had we not been able to cut that second side, a scientist looked at this footage. He said, within days, that net would have cut straight through her tail. Now, there's an artery that goes down the tail that regulates body temperature. That tail also allows her to get propulsion, to dive down and feed, to move and migrate. So she was basically condemned. That's 250 kilos of net that we were able to pull off. You see there's still a small piece of netting. We weren't able to keep up with her. This was two hours of work to cut this. One of our guys actually got his fin caught in the net. Um, so it is not um, something to take lightly. It can be dangerous. But the feeling you get after that moment is absolutely amazing. We all got back in the boat. I was filming. We had another videographer filming, and then we had two strong guys trying to keep up, holding onto the net, because she would dive down. You had to know when to let go, trying to keep up with her. We all got in the boat, and one guy stayed in the water, sort of floating with the net. And he started laughing, and then he started crying. And then he started laughing, and then he started crying. And I think that that really emulated for us what we all felt, is, is that, that dual side. This is one whale amongst so many. There's a lot more of these nets out there that are floating, unkempt, unseen. By fault of whom? There's regulations and laws that protect these animals. There's oceans that they are protected in. Should we not protect the entire system? So not to finish on a bad note, because there's, abs there's just many other beautiful stories. Um, this next piece, I'm just going to let you watch and enjoy. It's in Hawaii, another humpback whale story. We were filming in 2006 a series called America's Underwater Treasures, which is about the national marine sanctuaries of North America. And uh, we had an absolutely incredible and magic opportunity to swim with humpback whales. There were four males courting a female. It sounds kind of typical. <laughs> and then there was a mother and her calf. And with the mother and calf, we stayed on the surface and snorkel. And you'll see our divers are wearing these big uh, systems. They're actually rebreathers. They can stay under the water longer. Um, so that they were able to stay with the, the humpback males and the female. And creating bubbles is a form of aggression. These systems don't create bubbles. We certainly did not want to compete with a large humpback male whale. <laughs> um, so just enjoy the video. First technical difficulty, not too bad.
Sorry about this. You can't miss this piece. I'm going to have to ask you to stay until you see it. I'm going to reveal my desktop. Please look away. It's messy. Oh, it's embarrassing. Oh, these are flowers, by the way, in uh, the Juan Fernandez. Oh, he put it away. Thank you. God, you guys are such good tech people. <laughs> this is where you can tell. Like, I'm, I'm fine out in nature. Something goes wrong with an anaconda, I'm good. I'm good. You send a shark my way, I'm fine. You put me in front of a computer, I get frazzled. I can do email. Let's try this one. Is it worth it? So your conference has been about IT, but the theme of the conference is, is moving to action. And these are beautiful images, beautiful places. Um, they're there for all of us. And I really encourage everybody to take whatever it is that inspired you and take that with you. And however it is that you interpret it, do something with it. It's, it's wonderful to want to help and to think you should help but it's much better to actually move forward to doing something. Thank all of you for coming here. I know this is the end of two long days for you, and I'm very happy to be the final act. Um, so enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I think we might have Q&A, but thank you.